So Joshua 22, and I, I just want to read one verse here to get our topic. I have never thought about this phrase as hearsay, but that's exactly what it is. And uh, listen to verse number 11. And the children of Israel heard say. It's pretty obvious, right? Hear say. They heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan and the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children, uh, at the passage of, the children of Israel. So uh, this is a... At the passage, the place where they crossed there. So kind of keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that thought in a little bit. But before we dive into Joshua 22, and I want to read this entire chapter. Um, it's a long one. Read most of it anyway. But uh, I want to give you a little bit of background first. So let's go to Numbers 32 to kind of understand what's going on here and where we are, where, where the children of Israel have been, what the circumstances have been. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, along with the half-tribe of Manasseh, their inher inheritance has been determined to be on the east side of Jordan, right? The rest of the ten and a half tribes are going to be on the left side of Jordan, if you look on a map. So they're going to be in between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. If they we're looking at it this way, the Mediterranean over here and the Jordan here, right? So ten and a half tribes in this area, but over on this side, we've got two and a half tribes, Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so as they were coming, they had, uh, in, in Numbers 32, they had recently defeated Sihon, king of the Amorites, uh, and Og, king of Bashan. And so uh, when they're going in through this area here, uh, Reuben, Gad, and like I said, that half-tribe of Manasseh, they're looking at the area, and they come and they speak to Moses in verse number 2 and the rest of the congregation. And, uh, and, and they begin to say in verse 4, Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. It's like, this is a great land, great pasture land here if you have cattle. And guess what? We do. We've got an abundance of it. So, wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for possession and bring us not over Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And, uh, and when they went up into the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had, Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time. And He swore, saying, Surely none of those men that came out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed Me, um, save Caleb and Joshua. We know those were the two spies that came back and said, We can take the land. And so the Lord's anger was kindled kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the evil generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men, to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. So they make this request, and Moses says, it's the same song, second verse. You guys are doing it all over again, right? Here we are on the brink of entering the promised land. And what happened? Fear got hold of men's hearts. The first time around, they said, we can't take the land that God promised. And what did God do? God said, then none of you are going in, except for Joshua and Caleb. You guys are doing this all over. You're going to discourage the hearts of the people all over again after we're already dealing with the judgment of God as a result of that? Moses absolutely assumes the worst concerning their request, right? Well, what, did they, what were they really asking, according to the next portion? Um, and they came near to him and said in verse 16, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place, and our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man's in his every man his inheritance so they say and you can read the rest of the chapter when you've got more time but basically we're going to leave our wives and our kids here right we're going to we're going to build fence cities so there'll be some level of protection but all of us armed men we armed men we're going over with you guys and we're going to fall and we will fight and we will not forsake you until everybody has their inheritance all right fair enough and moses says okay you got to do that you got to do all of that uh, if you're going to have this land here on the other side. 
You've got to be obedient and faithful to this promise that you've made. And so I just want you to see that from the very outset of this request to remain east of Jordan, they were assumed to be sinfully motivated. Moses says you're taking advantage of the rest of the tribes. They all just fought for you so that you might secure this land here, right? They were all a part of the battle against Og and, and Bashan. Uh, um, uh, was it Og and Bashan? No, Sihon and Og was king of Bashan. They were all a part of that, but now you're going to forsake your brethren and, and just take advantage of them and enjoy the spoils of this fighting and, and, and forsake your brethren? What I want you to see here is they don't bow up and say, how dare you accuse us of that? You ever been wrongfully accused of something? You ever been accused of being sinfully motivated when your intentions were pure in the matter? There's a temptation there for that to fly all over you, right? And bow up and how dare you think that about me? No response like that. They just say, we'll go with you. Uh, they, they explain their intentions. They make a tremendous profession of faith in God to care for their loved ones and say, we'll leave them behind and we'll stay with you guys until the very end, until the inheritance is received. So uh, go to Joshua 14. I want us to understand about how long they were away from their families. Joshua 14 and in verse number 7. This is my best guess based on what it says here concerning how long it took. Um, they've committed themselves to remaining west of the Jordan until all the other tribes have their inheritance. And so chapter 22 is when they're going to go back to their inheritance on the east side. That's the chapter that we're in. Okay, so this is chapter 14. This takes place before they go back. And we learn something here. We get some of the timeline here in chapter 14 as Caleb uh, begins to talk to the children of Israel. In verse 7, he says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me, the heart of the people... Uh, uh, made the heart of the people melt. That's what Moses was accusing those two and a half tribes of. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore on the day, on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon uh, thou, thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty-five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Eighty-five years old. So Caleb said, I was forty years old when I went in and spied out the land. How many years were the children of Israel in the wilderness? 40 years, right? And so now, five years later, he said, I'm ready for my inheritance. So they've been fighting for at least five years. I want you to see that. Gad and the Reubenites and, and half the tribe of the Manassites, they have been away from their families for at least five years, fighting, trusting God's going to keep them. Remember, they're, they're bordered by nations, uh, by, uh, not, not by fellow Israelites, they're bordered by nations that would have been enemies to the Israelites, but they said, we're going to trust God to keep them. And so now for at least five years, they've been fighting with the children of Israel to see that they receive their inheritance. The Treasury of Scripture Knowledge says that it was actually more like seven. I've got a Bible at home that's got timelines in it. It said it was as, as, as long as, as ten years. Uh, but the point is they have been faithful to their word. They've proven themselves, right? They've been faithful to their word for five to ten years now. Not running back home, uh, you know, fighting right alongside them, not sneaking away. They were faithful and they were reliable. They were full of faith to trust God to care for their loved ones when they were such a long period on the other side of Jordan. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go back to Joshua 22. Joshua 22. And let's read the beginning of the chapter here as, as Joshua uh, sends them off now to receive their inheritance. And look at the witness. Look at what is evidenced by what Joshua says here. He only confirms their faithfulness. Then Joshua in verse 1 called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. Do you see the alls in that verse? You've kept all that Moses commanded you. You've obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You guys haven't failed in one point, right? You've been faithful in all of these things. Ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day. And like we said, this is at a minimum five years, uh, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. 
And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as He promised them. Therefore now return ye and get into your tents and into the land of your possession which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side. And so he encourages them to be diligent in keeping the law of God, to cling to Him. Joshua blesses them in verse number 6. And they go their way to their tents to inherit. They go with great spoil. They return with much riches, it says in verse number 8. And so they departed out of the land and they went back to their possession on on the west side of Jordan. So Joshua has nothing to say but good things about them, right? He has nothing to do but just confirm how faithful they've been all this time. There's no question of their loyalty. There's no mention of that time, that one time where they lost heart and they ran back home. You know, they, we, saw fire, we saw smoke in the distance. We better go check on them. None of that type of stuff, right? They were faithful. All, you've done all that you said to Moses that he commanded you. You've done all that I have commanded you. Um, but then we come to verses 10 and 12, and listen to that. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan uh, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to it. That last phrase there, too, has been added to see. It just means it was, it was great in the sight. This is something great to behold, right? This was an amazing, this was a, a, a majestic altar. This was a large altar that was uh, easy to see. What's the assumption based on the hearsay in verse number 11? And the children of Israel heard say, they received hearsay that they have built this altar over against the land of Canaan and the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Wow! What? Are you serious? These guys have been faithful for five plus years. They have been faithful to Joshua's word. They've been faithful to their promise to Moses. They've been faithful to God, right? They've been uh, unflinching in their faith towards God to care for their loved ones back home. And now you have one instance of hearsay, and it seems like before they even try to go investigate this thing, they've already made their decision in their hearts. We better gather to war. Wow. Hearsay is a dangerous thing, isn't it? Hearsay is a dangerous thing. Now, I do want you to see before we read on that the sin that was assumed of these two and a half tribes was a heinous crime. Okay, this was a serious matter. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter number 7. Hold your place in Joshua 22. Leviticus chapter 17. This is no small matter. Leviticus 17 and in verse number 8. It says, And thou shalt say unto them, Whoso, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers which sojourn among you that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice and bringeth it not to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be what? Cut off from among his... He has no part nor inheritance any longer among the children of Israel. He shall be cut off from the children of Israel. Same thing it says concerning those that ate blood in verse number 10. He shall be cut off from his people. So the Lord said... I'm going to establish the place where these sacrifices and offerings are to take place, where my tabernacle is, and that's the only valid spot, right, to perform these sacrifices. That's the only uh, approved place of God to perform these sacrifices. Well, the tabernacle was in Shiloh. That's where they were all gathered together here and decided to go to war. So this was a crime that was worthy of a people being cut off from the rest of Israel. Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. So that's if they were... Um, if they were offering sacrifices to God apart from where the tabernacle was. So that was a heinous crime. What about if they were building altars to false gods? What if they were participating in idolatry? Listen to verse number 12 of Deuteronomy 13. If thou shalt hear say, in one of thy cities which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. What is the instruction in verse number 14? Then shalt thou inquire and make search. Okay? And we're going to see that's what they do. They do that in Joshua 22. But I just wanted you to see they jumped the gun a little bit, right? They're already ready for war. They've already kind of come to their decision. But let's go make sure. 
uh, uh, the, the, the um, make search and ask diligently and behold if it be truth that the thing uh, certain and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of the city and if you read on God says kill them all kill all their livestock uh, I want you to burn the city I want you to burn everything that's there and you guys don't even take any of the stuff that's left right no spoil is to be taken it's to be burned to the ground and you're never to build there again that's how serious this was right so this is a serious matter and I don't want to I, I, I don't want to gloss over that it's a serious matter but God did give them instruction he said the first thing that you do when you have hearsay is you go and inquire and make search and ask diligently go find out firsthand right hear it from the horse's mouth right so why should we be suspicious of hearsay and I want us to I want us to grab hold of that our first response to hearsay it should be, I don't know, I better find out about this. Why is that? Because hearsay comes from the tongue. It comes from someone's mouth. And James 3, 6 through 8 says the tongue is set on fire of what? Hell! He said it's an unruly evil and nobody can tame the tongue. That's an impossibility. You're not going to be able to tame it, out, tame it outside of Jesus Christ. So the tongue, it says, is a world of iniquity. It's set on fire of hell. So we ought to be suspicious immediately when it comes to hearsay. We should be assuming the opposite of it instead of immediately embracing it, which it seemed like they did as they prepared themselves for war. In 1 Timothy 3.11, we've studied that recently, and that's the portion of Scripture that talks about the qualifications for the deacon's wives. And one of the things that it says they ought not be is they ought not be slanderers. And we studied that word, and I don't know if you remember, but when we look that word up, it's almost never translated that. In fact, that may be the only instance that it's translated slander. Most of the places, by far, it's translated devil. That they be not devils. And what I want us to see is that slander is associated with being a follower of Satan, right? Not being a follower of Christ. Propagating hearsay that hasn't been investigated and validated, that's, a, that's, that's the uh, attitude of Satan. They were said to not be slanders, not be propagating these deceptive things. Satan is called the what of the brethren? Accuser. The accuser of the brethren. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, right? He's the, he's the father of the lie. He's a master deceiver, right? I and mean, the first time we see him come on the scene, what's he doing? He's deceiving. He's deceiving with his words. And so they were said to not be slanderers. The same word devil there. Remember our Lord had many false witnesses against him. Right? They brought in these false witnesses against Christ. Hmm. When I pause like this, it means, wow, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. What do we do? Do we, <laughs> do we press on and try to slam through this or do we break this thing up? Let's look at, um, let's read James, okay? Let's go back and read that because I want you to see how James speaks of this tiny little member, right? This tiny little member called the tongue. And, and when he begins talking here, my brethren, be not many masters in verse number one here, speaking of those that are leading within the congregation, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. It, it, it just comes with the job, right? This is going to happen. Offenses are going to come. And when you're faithful to declare the truth, you're going to find offenses. And you've got others that are being deceptive in declaring the truth, and you've got offenses. The offense is going to be there. But listen to what it says in verse 2. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. James says if you can control this little member right here, You've got self-control over it all. This is the hardest thing for us to control. We put bits in the horse's mouths and we turn them how we want to, right? There's a little helm at the ship and the whole huge ship turns just with that little helm. He says, even so, the tongue is a little member in verse 5 and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And what about the tongue? The tongue is a fire. Only takes a spark, right, to set a blaze. The tongue is a fire. Uh, it is a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. 
Because man's tamed all of these animals, every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea. It's amazing. You go somewhere like SeaWorld and you see what they do with these huge wells, you know. It's amazing what man is able to tame, what he's able to control. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. He says, we bless God with it, even the Father, and therewith we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. That should have no place among the church of Jesus Christ, right? No place. Hearsay. Propagating these things with that tiny little member that's set on fire of hell. Look at Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. If you can't tell, I'm just resolved now. This is a two-week lesson. This is not a one-week lesson. Thank you, Lord. I'm bad about just blasting through it, and then we go a little over, and I felt like I said so much that you guys, your head's spinning. Satan, we said, is called the accuser of our brethren. Um, he loves to make the Lord's people look bad. He, he desires to do that. He desires to paint them in, in a bad light. And I want you to see how Satan's followers were uh, active against the Lord Jesus in Mark 14 and in verse number 5. These are slanders here. These are men participating in hearsay. These are men that are propagating lies. In Mark 14 and in verse number 55, And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, and found none. For many bear what kind of witness? False witness. How many people were bearing false witness? Many. Many bear false witness against Him, against Jesus, to put Him to death. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I jumped back up to verse 55. Many bear false witness against Him, but their witness agreed not together. And so they go on, certain bear false witness against Him in verse 57. We heard Him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. Question for you. Did Jesus actually say that? He did, right? He did. The, the, the thing that they're saying is, it's not that the thing they're saying is untrue. It's not that when the report came back and said, they've built a great altar, that that was untrue. The problem was the assumption that was made as to why they built that great altar. Right? The problem was that what they're, they're saying here concerning what Jesus meant when He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. We know that He was talking about the temple of His body. So it, it's, they're, they're propagating that which is not true. They assume something based on what they heard and then they spread it around. But even in that, their witness didn't agree. Um, and so they questioned Jesus firsthand, but Jesus held his peace because this is the reason he came into the world. These false witnesses were going to have their day and have their power over him in this hour so that the, the plan of God would be fully accomplished. I just wanted you to see in that though that Christ was subjected to that. So that we understand, Christian, we're going to be subjected to that. There were many false witnesses against the Lord Jesus. We're going to encounter the same thing. And don't think it's strange, right? Think it not strange, the fiery trials which are meant to try you. It must needs be that what come? Offenses. Offenses come. Just don't be on the offending end, right? But woe to the one by whom the offense cometh. Be better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he was cast into the sea. This is what happened to the Lord Jesus. This is what also what happened to his apostles. Look at uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3, speaks, is God unrighteous that takes vengeance? Verse number 5, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if, if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? In, in other words, God is sovereign, right? And God even is sovereign over sin. And God, well, we, just, we just read it, right? These false accusers were accomplishing the will of God. Would they be judged for their false accusations? Absolutely, right? Would jo Judas be judged for betraying the Lord Jesus? Absolutely. But was Judas fulfilling the will of God when he betrayed the Lord Jesus? Absolutely. God's will was being accomplished, right? And so Paul is dealing with this question 
How can God judge, right? It's the whole Romans 9 then. Why then does he find fault? Uh, can God judge if he's sovereign over sin and accomplishing his purposes even using sin? Well, God is God in spite of sin, right? God accomplishes his purposes in spite of of sin. And he, and he says in verse 8, and not rather, and this is the phrase I want you to see, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. I'm not sure who he's talking about. I'm not sure he's talking about people that do believe that. Let's do good that evil shall come. Sounds to me like he's talking about those that are slandering against us and false accusing us, right? So I want you to see the seriousness of propagating hearsay. I want you to see the seriousness of propagating slander, whose damnation is just, the apostle says here. So that was their experience. We were falsely uh, accused, right? We were slanderously reported against the pattern for the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, it's going to be the pattern for us. We're going to, uh, the email that Brother Gene sent, sent out with that article in it, that's exactly, these are the type of things that I'm seeing, this, this slanderous talk being propagated against those that are doing right. Those that are living truthfully. I know there's a lot of ungodliness out there that calls itself the church of Jesus Christ. Guess what, church? We're going to be lumped together with all of that. There's going to be false accusations against the true church. Don't be surprised it was like that for Jesus. Don't be surprised it was like that for Paul and the apostles. But what I want us to see as we continue this study is what matters is how we respond to that. All right? Hearsay is going to happen. We need to make sure we're not a part of that. The devil, there's plenty of wickedness going on out there. Don't let it in here. And this is one of the ways that we're going to see the devil gets in and tries to divide within the true body of Christ. We're going to have to war against that. We're going to have to do it in the pattern of Jesus Christ. And I think the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of the Manassites are a tremendous example of that. So Lord willing, we'll get back to that next week. Any